So today I will read a segment from uh, a chapter of my book manuscript that I'm working on called Afterwork, which is an anthropological study of the incursion of capitalist modernity in Bangladesh through the global apparel industry and the forms of life it has generated for its female workforce. Low wages, combined with the lack of trade unions and government oversight of the industry, enabled Bangladesh to become second to China in terms of apparel production. Today, it is the largest source of foreign revenues for the government at 30 billion, and it remains a vital industry as the country climbs to a lower middle income status. In Bangladesh, the age, uh, the garment labor force is primarily female and young. Workers enter around the average age of 15 years and are aged out by 45 years when they are no longer considered productive by factory management. Approximately 4 million workers are in the apparel industry. Not only have these workers migrated to the city in search of a better life, they have also married and reproduced the second generation of workers. These women have given the best years of their lives to help grow a global apparel industry that benefits Western consumers and retail giants and led to the formation of a new capitalist class in Bangladesh without getting the benefit of a living wage, health care or an adequate pension plan. These are bodies in bare existence, broken with weakened eyesight, kidney and chronic upper respiratory problems, all compounded by low wages, precarious work conditions. Until 2013, factories were not even inspected, inspected for quality control and fires were routine occurrences. Poor diet and unhealthy living situations. So what I did in my research is I followed the life course method developed by historian Tamara Harheven and conducted case studies with 20 aged out workers. This is the core of my research. I also talked to a lot of other younger workers. So there's a difference between the older aged out workers that I focused on and the new generation of workers that are coming in at higher wages. But what I want to tell you today is a story about an aged out worker, Nilofa, who has passed away. On an afternoon visit to a labor rights advocacy office, I met with uh, Shanaz, their cafe coordinator, to discuss the issue of why some workers disguised their names when they came to work in the garment industry. Shanaz said that it's because many of them didn't have a national identity cards. Then she said to me, these workers often have no idea as to where such ideas can lead when they use uh, identity cards that have names of other people or they change their names. The incident I'm talking about today occurred in 2005. At that time, Anju, remember this name, was the field officer at this labor rights group and Nilufa, the woman I'm going to talk about, was a cell member of a workers group. Nilufa was married at a young age and the dowry was settled at around Taka 50,000. Unable to pay the dowry, Nilufa faced tremendous domestic abuse from her husband. Finally, she left the village without his knowledge and came to Taka to find employment. But after some time, her husband tracked her to the city and forcibly took her back to their village. Back in the village, he poured kerosene over her and burned her. Although Nilufa was badly burned, she lived. After this, the labor organization brings Nilufa back to the city and her husband has a domestic violence case filed and he was sent to jail for three years. Her husband now disappears from Nilufa's life. After she recovered from her injuries, Nilufa rejoined the garment industry. She also met a man with whom she started a new relationship. They got married, although her second marriage was probably not legal. At some point, her second husband discovered that she had been married previously and that she had a child from that marriage. When he discovered that deception, he began to physically abuse her. The reason for this abuse was not only her deception, but also financial. She was putting aside about $6 a month in a savings account. Her husband demanded that she hand over the money to him. Nilufa refused to do that, and that increased the friction between them. As a result of the beatings and abuse, she would frequently fall ill. 
During this time, she contracted jaundice that had attacked her liver and her stomach swelled up from the disease. In all likelihood, she was also pregnant at this time. One day, her husband kicked her in the abdomen, causing severe hemorrhaging. She was taken to the hospital where the doctors determined that she had developed a severe infection in her uterus and in their opinion, she was in the last stage of life. So after this, although they tried to help her, she passed away. The story takes an interesting, turning, uh, interesting turn at this point. Anju and Nilfa's mother accompanied her body in an ambulance to her village for burial. When they arrived there, Anju told the villagers who had assembled that this dead woman was Nilufa, a woman from their village. Anju had brought the death certificate and other documents to prove her identity. The villagers asked her mother, is this your daughter? She said, yes, this is my daughter and her name is Nilufa. Nilufa's mother was in a state of shock from the death of her daughter and was not coherent in her speech and often contradicted herself. Then the villagers got suspicious. They said that we recognize Nilufa's mother as a woman from our village, but her daughter's name is not Nilufa. Her daughter had a husband, but she did not live with him. So who was this dead woman that you have brought to our village? Nilufa's body had also swollen up from her disease and death and her face was unrecognizable and the body had already beginning, was beginning to smell. The villagers accused Anju of human trafficking and that she was trying to bury this woman in their village under false pretenses. Then the assembled villagers raised another issue. They said they did not know if this woman was Hindu or Buddhist. Therefore, how can they bury her? During this controversy, Nilufa's mother lost her consciousness several times. Finally, she was able to state that her daughter's real name was Nur Jahan, who had gone to the city to work. Then she married another man and changed her name to Nilufa. And this was done in order for her first husband never to be able to locate her. The local imam who was present at the meeting then remarked, this woman, now identified as Nur Jahan, already had a husband. She lived with another man against Islamic law. According to Sharia, she would have been, she should be beaten 101 times, Dora. This corpse should not be buried anywhere in our village. At this time, the local headmaster arrived at the scene. The headmaster, as a man of learning, is a respected figure in the village. After he listened to all sides, he said that this woman had gone to the city to save her life. He added that they should allow her body to be buried and her real identity can be determined later. Finally, Nilufa Nur Jahan was buried at the edge of the village burial ground at 10 p.m. at night. If we were to pose the question, who, what was responsible for the death of Nilufa slash Nur Jahan, what answer would we get? In the immediate analysis, her two husbands were responsible for her death. But if we analyze the situation further, we see a range of actors who were directly or indirectly responsible. The dual processes of disinvestment by the state in the agricultural sector and environmental degradation have forced a large segment of the rural population, like Nilufa, to migrate to the city in search of work. Yet once in the city, they're trapped by the greed of factory, factory owners who keep workers' wages abysmally low. Uh, and until uh, 2006, wages were um, less around uh, $22 a month, the time of her death. So low wages had weakened her health from poor nutrition and her body's ability to fight against multiple diseases. Global buyers like HMN and Walmart are equally responsible for manufacturing clothes in such bleak conditions for workers. The Bangladeshi state is also responsible for it views these workers as disposable bodies to supply the fuel for economic growth. And finally, the consumer, who is in constant search of cheap clothes in a far, under fast fashion, where clothes are often used only once and then quickly disposed of. All of us are part of this global chain of manufacturing, the race to the bottom that is disparring the lives of workers in the global south. I share this profoundly tragic story uh, because it illuminates many of the aspects of garment workers' lives that I've documented. These aged out workers suffer from multiple betrayals, 
by factory owners, Western buyers, trade unions, political parties, the state, and the men in their private lives. These women are trapped between the patriarchy of the home and global capital, between their aspirations for a better life and the brutal conditions of work, between their desire for romantic love and the betrayals by the men they fall in love with. It is about the lack of sovereignty of the worker over her life. It is, but life is also about small acts of freedoms, occasional pleasures that make life meaningful, and the choices people make as they navigate the factory and urban landscape under the stranglehold of global capital. It is, as one woman said to me, the need for an embrace. It is about chasing rainbows in the empty spaces of modernity.